Well, good morning. Good to be with you this morning and uh, sharing in the Word. This morning we're in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 to 22. It will come up on the screen behind me uh, a little while later. Um, But if you want to turn there in your physical Bibles or your your phone Bible, tablet Bible, whichever way you've got it, um, it would be great to have that ready. So we're in our series in in Peter. We're well into it now. And uh, as we continue looking at it, and a question that we can ask ourselves is, in the midst of a confusing and conflicting world, do you know the hope that you have in Christ Jesus? So this world that we live in, as I'm sure you don't really need me to tell you, if you're an observer of the news, is quite confusing at the times, and it is quite conflicting. But and within that, do we know the hope that we have in Christ Jesus? And it's been interesting that the songs that we have been singing this morning reflect a lot of what comes out in 1 Peter 3 and in the message that I want to bring this morning. So the message that uh, today is living ready. And uh, perhaps in me, your immediate thought is to think of living ready for, for the, the second coming. Um, but actually the context is different to that. It's living ready to share the gospel with whoever asks you the reason for the hope that you have within you. And uh, so let's read 1 Peter chapter 3 and um, verses 8 to 22. Finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic, love one another and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called for this so that you may inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and to see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit, and let him turn away from evil and do what is good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer right for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear them or be intimidated. But in your heart, regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and reverence, keeping a clear conscience So that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit in which he also went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in the past were disobedient when God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. In it a few, that is, eight people, were saved through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. Amen. Amen. And um, there's a lot going on in this passage, as I'm sure you're aware. And I'm sure there are probably a lot of you who would like me just to speak on the last few verses. What is all that about? But I would need a whole message probably and a bit more to unpack everything that's going on in those last few verses from um, 19 to, uh, through to the, to the end. Uh, so, uh, you know, go away and talk about that with others. You know, have a discussion time and see what you conclude on that. Read different versions to get a different feel for that. So there's no way I can poss- possibly cover everything that is going on here. Uh, But I do want to draw out what I I believe God has laid on my heart in the context of this scripture. And I I want you to notice that that word hope sitting right in there. It's a a big thing for Peter. 
He mentions it three times in chapter 1. And it's written to a suffering church that was in danger of being suffocated by anxiety and fear. And in the midst of that, he is wanting to give them a hope. He is wanting to give them a reason for living to keep on going. That we have all sorts of hopes, don't we, in the world in which we live. There are exam results. There, there's, will I get that job? There, there's the weather. Is it going to be fine tomorrow? Uh, the holiday, will it be great? Uh, that there's that desire that things will turn out for the better, etc. And some of those things are, are met and others are, are not. Some are dashed, aren't they? But they are small things in the light of the hope that Peter is talking about, that hope that we have in Jesus Christ that transcends all other hopes. A hope that is ground in who he is, God manifest in the flesh, and his defeat of Satan, sin, death, and hell through his life, his death, his resurrection, and ascension. And Peter talks about it in chapter 1 as a living and certain hope. It's not a hope-so hope. It's a real, concrete hope. Jesus has died. Jesus has risen again. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And in that, there is every hope for us when we pass from this life. And so it includes an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you and for me. I want to say hallelujah, because I think that is tremendous, isn't it? And I know the number of funerals that I have conducted over the years, it is that that sits right at the heart of the Christian funeral, that this is not the end, this is not all that there is, there is more to come because of Jesus and because of everything that he has done. Jesus is our only ground for such assurance. And so we sing, don't we, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Without the hope that Christ is for us both now and in the future, we will end up engaged in self-preservation and self-enhancement. We could unpack that one a whole lot more. We will worry. We will fret. We will seek to control things. But if we understand our hope is in God, we can be free not only in ourselves, but free to love others as God calls us to. The context of Peter's writing then is a world that has been judged in Christ and is passing away. And he will write to them about that, particularly when he writes into Peter about two or three years later. And it's something that Peter is at pains to reiterate. This world has been judged in Christ and it is passing away. Nevertheless, it's still a place of conflict, both within and without. There are sinful desires, he talks about, that wage war against the soul. Earlier in, in, two, in 1 Peter 2, 11, Peter said, Dear friends or beloved, I warn you as strangers and exiles or temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from sinful desires, desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And the other is that conflict without, there's, there's persecution and there's suffering and they, they're trying to understand that. What is going on? Persecution and suffering from all the world that is antagonistic to the message of the gospel, to the message of Jesus Christ, seeking to undermine their faith and confidence in Jesus. And there's a lot of that going on in the world today, isn't there? It may be more subtle, but it's there, it's out there. And it's a recurring theme throughout this book. And so I want to give you five things that help us to live in hope because it's having that hope that enables us to be confident to share the gospel that we believe. And so number one, I want to say, picking up on an earlier chapter, chapter 2, verse 11, look after your soul. It's something I have been thinking about for probably several months now, about the nature of the human being and the fact that we have a soul. And one of the reasons for that is there are a number of Bible teachers around now who who actually conflate the soul with the physical being. And that, so when you die, you die completely. And you will only rise again 
when, when we, at the time of the resurrection. That is not biblical. And I don't have time to unpack all of that. But you have a soul. And that soul is very, very precious. Scripture teaches that we have a soul, the center of who we are, an invisible inner world that transcends the physical you and me and will live eternally. And it's important because the soul is our control center, our means of navigating life. Surrender to it and we're in trouble. Allow your feelings to become your guide and you're in trouble. Peter is after their transformation. And for that to happen, we need to understand the central role that the soul plays within the process. So we need to be aware that we have a soul. We need to be be aware where the battle is at. And so he outlines a few things here. He, he talks about fleshly lusts. Fleshly lusts entice us to uproot our, our, our dependent life, pulling it away from God, which in turn deprives our souls of what they need to function correctly in, in, in living and regulating our whole being. Secondly, they can be smothered by the cares of this world, producing anxiety, fear, and stress. In 1 Peter 5, verse 7, Peter says, Casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. And then when he gets over into 2 Peter, he'll be warning them about false teachers who who could mislead their souls. And at the back of it all is the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Whom they are to resist steadfast in the faith. And just simply within that context, and I say I'd love to hack that a whole lot more, we need to own our souls and take responsibility for them. Secondly, he says there in in chapter 3, sanctify or set apart Christ the Lord as holy in your heart or in your soul. Peter was after their transformation And that transformation doesn't begin by uh, working on things from the outside in. It starts on the inside and works outward. For the Christian, this means not only acknowledging who Jesus is and what he has done, but recognizing him as Lord of your life. Not just giving him some little space to be Lord over, but for him to be Lord over it all. It involves confessing that. It involves bringing every thought, every decision, and every action into agreement with that. And I wonder this morning, where do you sit with that? Is he Lord over an area? Lord, I give you permission in that area, but he's not over some other aspect of your life. And then thirdly, he speaks about living in unity in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, and and in 2, verse 5. Live in unity, understanding and humility. And when you read this particular verse, uh, we're jumping into something there that we've already had mentioned earlier on, that when we come to know Christ, which he talks about in the first chapter, and as Barney has just been saying just a little bit earlier over communion, we are also joined to a body. We are called to be a people together. And uh, this is is fascinating. Finally, all of you, he says, be, be, be connected to one another. So it involves connection and it involves engagement. The theme runs throughout the book there, personal salvation, being built together as living stones. Sometimes we can be rolling stones, (laughs) drifting away here and there. uh, But God wants us to be built together as living stones. I remember years ago doing an illustration. I brought a whole load of bricks into church. And I I laid them out a bit like building a wall. And then I put one one or two in different places, one or two leaning a little bit uh, in different ways. And then asked people which stone they thought they were. God wants us all to be built together as living stones into a temple. A place where we can have fellowship, where we are truly a spiritual house offering spiritual sacrifices. And so there's connection, there's engagement within that. Then there's that context of fellowship where we enjoy being with one another. We, We bear one another's burdens. We pray for one another. We rejoice 
with one another. We are a, a priesthood where everybody has the right to go to God on behalf of others and come from God with something from God for others. So in that context, we are to live in unity, in love, understanding, and humility. And then fourthly, in 3 verses 9 to 17, but in the middle there, it says, turn from it away from evil and do what is good. Do what is good. In other words, if, we, if we're being drawn towards evil, the likelihood is we're not going to be doing good either. But so he says, turn away from evil and do good. And that should be the focus of the Christian in Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. talks about the fact that we should be salt and light. And, and salt is, is not only something that is used to savor something. Salt is also used as a fertilizer in, in the New Testament days. We're called to be salt and we're called to be light in the darkness. Both in small things, little things, big things, large things. And, and I love the way there he just talks about the fact of doing good. That's a big emphasis in there, in those few verses that are there that he quotes from uh, Psalm 34. For the one who wants to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And let him turn away from evil and do what is good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. And just dropping something in there, it just says to me also, don't neglect the Old Testament in your reading. The New Testament writers made use of the Old Testament. It is part of our story. Don't neglect the Old Testament in your reading of Scripture. And then lastly, number five, know in whom you have believed. And you have this running right the way through the book in chapter 1, verses 3 to 9, 18 to 21. Chapter 2, verse 4, 6, and 21 to 25. Chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. And then in 5, verse 22 as well. So Peter was very concerned that they should know the one in whom they had believed. You can't be ready, in other words, if you don't know. And so Peter repeatedly brings them back to Jesus. And he holds Jesus before them. And so in other words, it's know who Jesus is. Know what he has done. Know who you are in him. And know the glorious hope that he has given you through his death and resurrection. And so that the suffering Christ is also the victorious Christ. Just as he suffered, he is able to help those who are suffering. And just as he suffered and was victorious, so will we be. Hallelujah. And so you look at all that is going on there. And there is a whole lot that Peter is drawing on. And the fascinating fact is that in chapter 3, verse 8, right there... Um, in my version, it says, finally. He's one of those preachers who finally starts halfway through what he's doing. Okay? And, and you think he's going to give a paragraph or two, and he's actually unpacking a finally. In other versions, it, it says, to sum up. And, and, and so he's gathering everything that he said before, and he's re-emphasizing it and expanding on it because he wants them to get it. He wants them to know that the hope that they have in Jesus in a confusing and a conflicting world so that they might be able to live confidently their Christian life, their, live out their Christian faith, their Christian life, and that when others come along, they meet them through their daily lives and say, there's something different about you. What is it that is different about you? Why is it that you have a different spirit? You don't get caught up in a whole load of depression when you look at the news, etc. And it, it can be depressing if that's where our focus is. But why, why is it that you have a confidence about you as you live out your life? And so Peter says, this is the reason. It's because of the hope that is within you. This world is, is not our home, as the old song says. We're just a passing through. We're on a journey. 
This is not the, the end of our lives when we come to it. We have a glorious hope, a wonderful hope in Christ Jesus. And one of the things that Peter will go on to do is to talk about how one day these heavens and the earth as we know it will be destroyed. But there will be a new heaven and a new earth, which is perfect in every way and in which righteousness dwells. And so we have a wonderful message to proclaim because we have a wonderful hope in Christ Jesus. So as I close this morning, some questions here. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you had a personal encounter with him in which you can say, yeah, I have believed in him. I know he has forgiven my sins. Have you got connected to a church? Could be this one, could be another one, but it's important that you're connected to a church. A church that can help you and sustain you and encourage you and stand with you in your faith, in your life. And then again, what are you doing to grow and increase in your faith? What are you doing to get to know Jesus better, that you might be more confident in him? What does your life look like? Can people look at you and see Jesus, or do they look at you and see something else? And then what about looking out for ways to, to do good? You've got this passage here, it's full of goodness. What are the, what, what way, look out for ways to do good as you go about this week, to bless somebody, to show something of the goodness of God. And then what are you doing to maintain a healthy soul? Maybe you need to go away and give some more thought to your soul. You just lived in the realm of your mind and your emotions and, and so on. But to go away and give more thought to your soul and how you might nurture it and make it healthy and that it might uh, grow and flourish and be in full health. And then when you go about your week, look out for opportunities to share your faith that confidence that you have in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we bless you for everything that you have done for us in Jesus. You're an amazing God. And Lord, what a hope you have given to us. Lord, we praise you that this world is not our home because, Lord, it's a mess. And we do pray for it. God, that you would show your mercy and your grace to a broken a messy world, that others might come to know you. We praise you, Lord, that one day you're going to make everything new. And what a change that's going to be. And what a hope you have given us in Jesus. And so, Holy Spirit, we just pray, come and fill our hearts and lives with your love, with your grace. Transform us that we might truly be salt and light, that we might be witnesses to the world about us, that we might be able to demonstrate to them by our lives the hope that you've given us, that we might be able to speak to them of it with our words. In Jesus' name, amen.